Today we hear from indigenous people in our country about their life experiences, their hopes for the future, and how we can support indigenous families and communities within Canada. I'm James Curtis of The Drive, and this is part of Trinita Bowden's story. What it means to me on the Truth and Reconciliation, um, you know, God delivered me from a lot of things. And my relationship and that intimacy with the Father is so key when he talks about um, how we are to be reconcilers, we are to be ministers of reconciliation, firstly, to know Christ. But uh, sadly, there's so many who are hurting in this time because of what the church has done. Um, But my heart on this day is to not only encourage and build up our Indigenous people that God wants to heal them and help them to soar in their purpose, but also to help plant the seed of individuals who are non-Indigenous to um, really be aware and attentive uh, to uh, the heart of Indigenous people, not so much the cultural things we do, but who we are. And this is what I share a a message uh, called soaring and self-image. And we need to come to a place to know who we are. I mean, we could do all kinds of things traditionally, um, but spiritually, who we are, who God created us to be in his image is so beautiful. And um, my prayer is to see that awareness brought forth um, on this day. Um, It's not just a day to acknowledge um, the children from the past. But, but last night I was just at a meeting and God spoke to me clearly to honor the children now because we can't make the same mistake again. And this is what I've been trying to share with the church and individuals that we have to plant seeds and give memories and moments of every opportunity we can to see our children prosper, to see our families prosper and to help rebuild um, the hearts of those who've been hurt. You know, I grew up in a single parent home. It was not easy. It was 1977 and um, I was 11, I believe. And I um, was taken out of the home. And back in that time, it was 1961 up to, I think, 1980s. It was that whole 60 scoop era. People look at the residential school and they say, oh, it was just for the people who were in residential schools put in foster homes who were adopted. But there were thousands of Indigenous kids placed in foster homes when they recognized dysfunction, obviously with well-meaning purposes, but what they did not know is that um, the system did not grasp how they were creating divide in families, not working with the parent, not working with the child together. Um, So growing up, you know, I was 11 years old up to 15 and six foster homes being transferred like a yo-yo back and forth. Imagine you're taken out of the home you're moved into a group home, which I thought was a safe place. And I found out it was mainly for young offenders who caused trouble. Get put in this home, bullied by two young girls. Back then I used to have crossed eyes as a kid and I used to get teased so much. And um, that was tragic for me. So what did I do? I went down to the leadership. I, I want to be in a safe place. I don't want to be upstairs with those bullies. They truthfully, they were not trained, not so much trauma, but child parent separation because that is a very tragic thing that happens and um so what happened was um of course when you're young you're like i want my mummy yeah <laughs> and it up that they did not understand the need they were just authoritative positional leaders because i said i want my mummy i wasn't mean or anything like that and they threatened me at 11 years old and said if you don't go back to your room we're going to call the police now you can imagine seeing your mom beaten to a pulp, seeing police at your door every day, and all of a sudden being threatened, supposedly in a safe place. So, of course, your brain just goes, why? (laughs) And I remember they literally did. They called the police. And when they showed up, I'm just like shocked because it's all I've ever seen, right? And so it ended up, um, I'm crying. I'm grieved of the, the betrayal of broken promises and personally the poor conduct of leadership well of course i was trying to run away from the fear right of bad leadership and it ended up they actually handcuffed me i wasn't violent or suicidal i'm not i was not even near any of that stuff i was just having a tantrum because i was hurting and i remember they handcuffed me and then brought me to another receiving home to prepare me 
for the next foster home. So what blows me away is what took place in the residential school and the 60 Scoop era is people do not understand what the child and the parent felt. Now my mom struggled with alcohol, she struggled with hurt, wounds, right? I understand where it all came from. But instead of the system coming alongside and saying, we're going to help you, we're going to coach you, we're going to train you and help you grow so that you and your daughter can live in a healthy environment. They never did that. And so, and they're not doing it 100% now. And so, um, so this concerns me. So of course, you know, growing up, I started to follow the similar pattern of what my mom did, right, for a time, you know, wrong guys, wrong relationships. Thank God I never got pregnant. I'm so grateful for that. Um, but he had my hand. He had the call in my life ever since I was even four. I remember having an encounter with God. And I knew deep down, as much as I wanted to help my mom in the process, I, I couldn't help her. I was a young kid just trying to figure out how I'm going to fit. But I knew that there was a call in my life somehow. And of course, at the age of 15, I, I had the choice to go back into the foster care system or start on my own. And uh, my mom and I had this huge fight and it was scary. I thought I was going to die that night because she was really aggressive and I knew I needed to get out. So I went to thinking I had the world by the hook, went and lived in this, uh, my own apartment and I got a job. I went to school, was a hairdresser, um, started teaching aerobics and I started moving forward into my dream of living on my own. And then it was when I was 28, I got a V8 and the power of God touched me in a mighty way. And I remember back in those days, rolling a marijuana joint and saying, hey, if this was what life is like, I don't want it. And I was crying out to God. That's when I heard him say, my daughter, every time you hurt your body, you're hurting me. You could see angels in the natural pull me down. And it was a God encounter, no drug rehab. It was a God factor and said, your life can change if you just take the first step. And then I started learning about taking care of my health and went to massage college and started getting some good grades in the sciences. And I thought, I can do this. Through God, I can do this. In 1995, after going through the massage college and seeing lots of different things in that realm, uh, God just started to pull me aside and said, it's time, my daughter, I'm calling you. And I invited him into my life and I've never been the same since. And I am still on fire the same as I was back then. <laughs> and I'm just so grateful for that relationship that I have with Jesus. I believe that um, a lot of the reconciliation that's been happening, it's all the practical, you know, let's let let's let everybody participate in the culture and that's that's a portion there's so much more that god wants to do in that perspective and to really hear the hearts and to really um you know that restoration call really it's so important to understand that we got to come past the stereotypes and um you know i've served several communities in reaching 67 communities in the north and um you know, God's really speaking to me about three responsive ways that we can restore and build First Nations families. And this is just brainstorming off a few and some other strategies that he's given me. But, um, you know, we need to, uh, number one, appreciate them, not just for what they do and the culture and all these things, but more so who they are as people, that there are people of the land that that can really help many you know, if we were to break out in a war, I can tell you right now, a lot of our people would be able to help teach some of the war vets on how to survive, you know, and um, but we need to appreciate them. We need to honor them. And that's one of the reasons why we do what we do. And three words I always tell people, three words I want you to understand. And that's this. You are valuable, precious and loved. I tell that to everyone, especially our indigenous people. Number two is believing in them and believing in who they are. And secondly, is is really bringing coaching, and that's what I'm doing now with the John Maxwell team as well, is coaching and bringing comfort. Um, a few strategies God woke me up about that I, I really feel is important um, in relational healing, um, to assist in that restoration um, with Indigenous families um, as a whole, and that is uh, back to what I was saying, believe in them, but to really come to a place to um, remind them of their value 
And that's something that I find very, very powerful um, that we need to help them to realize that they're valued in Christ. You see, man came along with an iron fist with religious spirits planning to do all kinds of things and manipulating them in all the ways. And believe it or not, I was trained by an awesome leader. And he said, I interviewed him and he said, a lot of the teachings, even some of the traditional ways, each, each tribe does different things, but they've developed some of it from the Catholic Church. So it's not all indigenous ways. Um, but to resist the stereotype, as I shared before, and, um, you know, there's a lot of critics out there. I hear a lot of stereotype. Oh, indigenous people are always struggling with drugs and alcohol, and they're all, you know. But my call, and uh, with especially writing my book, Healing from Pain to Purpose, is I'm like, give me the Corneliuses. Because it's time that we start raising up the entrepreneurs in this land. Um, I personally have never owned a home. You know, I saw my mom struggle with, I'll never be able to mount up to anything. She's been bullied and beaten down by male leadership or leadership as a whole in the church as well. And a lot of our people have felt that way. And so, and what happens is people go into these communities, autonomy, who have lots of resources going, we can do it better than you. And therefore, we don't need you. We'll just do it for you. But what we really do need is mentorship. We need coaching. We need encouragement to help them so that they can stand on their own two feet and to say that you can do this. Um, Respect is a huge part of Indigenous ways. So, you know, the truth and reconciliation is one of their passions. But biblically, respect is something that's called in all aspects of the word of God. And, uh, you know, to listen with empathy and be compassionate, to listen to the hearts, to stand with the frontliners, <laughs> huge, 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 huge. And also, if I can just share lastly, is um, to really rebuild trust and to um, renew and revive their dream. As I shared earlier, um, it's not about them doing their own thing. Right? It's like us trying to go to church and saying, hey, I'm going to be the pastor today. It's about respecting and coming along people who've been there, people who work with the Indigenous people, and starting there, rebuilding the trust. That is the start. And, God's, and, and God says it also. He talks about trust. Um, trust no man, he says. Trust God. But we do have to come to a place that we have to come to trust. And... Um, how we start i mean for for us we've been we started our servants out christmas project actually right through the beginning of opposition and god said it's time and i said okay and he said i want you to go start touching your people and start um being a vessel to start assisting the healing that i'm going to use for my glory and um and that has been i remember i said lord i don't know how i really don't know how i don't know when I just know you and that's who. And um, I didn't feel I had the support of churches. I didn't have, I just went to stores and got goods. And um, my heart was to literally, we have to take it literally to come away from our Christian perspective of our programs and, and just flow in the Holy Spirit to snatch them from the fire. You know, I remember once I went on a team and this team said, would you come be a spiritual leader as we go on this mission team? And it was lovely. They did renovations. They did all this practical stuff topically, but relationally there were people that were hurting and God just had me like, they call me a radar woman. I can radar in the spirit. And right away, this pastor comes out of the blue and says, I need you to pray for this girl. I'm going to bring her in to hang out with you. I said, sure. He brings her in and she's sitting there while everybody's laughing and having fun around the table and wonderful time. And I said, do you want to go outside? Is there something bothering you? And we took her outside and she says, I don't want to live anymore. And, and it just hit my heart. And I could hear music and the concert over there playing and the celebration of all the Christians on their mission team playing. And here's me zoomed in like Jesus saying, your life matters to me. You've got to, we can't come to a place to listen to the heart of those who are doing the work of the ministry and not try to um, come alongside to check off their list on their mission checklist for their newsletter, but to say, hey, how can we come alongside you and plant seed and, and, and be teachable to learn? Because autonomy, this is what's happened, Holly, years ago. 
our indigenous people made the snow goggles. They made the spruce gum. They made so many things, the snowshoes. And society and autonomy has come alongside. And they've taken it for their own gain. And they've not, and they've outcasted indigenous people. So we're starting to slowly see government come alongside. And that's all fine. But the heart has to be in it. John Maxwell talks about building trust, consistency builds trust. So if it's all about their big church and their big ministries and so on, we're missing it. We have to come alongside and say, how can we mentor? How can we build up? And um, that is just really, I believe, the heart of God. He discipled. He came alongside the 12 and he discipled them. But interesting enough, some of the Christian community, which I think is wonderful, I love, they're, they're, my, they're my family, but I feel some of them need to be discipled. I think we could actually sit them in a canoe for a week and teach them how to come out of their Torontonian lifestyle and listen and just listen and grow and learn and work with those um, who are trying. Because if people come alongside and say, hey, I can do better than that, but instead of listening attentively of what they can learn from our Indigenous people, right? And not just, I'm not talking the traditional component here, I'm talking about practical ways of the family or hunting or how they communicate. Um, some of our people have a hard time with too much noise and too much stimulation, right? Everybody's type A, type A here in the city. Um, even I have to tame down, <laughs> you know? And so it, it's, it's so important to really listen because especially now, because when COVID hit, a lot weren't listening. They were all listening about COVID news and, Many weren't listening to what was going on to our Indigenous people. So, hmm. yeah, so we got to listen.